Thanks for joining me, Michael. Yeah, my pleasure. So um, maybe just to begin, I'll ask you the question that I ask everyone, which is, could you sort of introduce yourself and tell us about your, your background and your life story? And you could answer that in whatever way you like, at whatever length you like. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so I'm Michael Smith, um, which is an incredibly unique name. <laughs> um, Although there's there's a there's a cute quirk that actually followed me for a long time. It seems worth um, worth giving this snippet of um, when I was a, uh, a teen, roughly I think it was about thirteen or fourteen. I had a group of friends who um, uh, who started calling me Val. I don't know, a lot of people knew me as Val, and, um, and uh, they'd explained, yeah, like so we're we're reading through Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land and. Um, and here you are like being brilliant and like you're from some other world and you have no idea how to be human, but we still have a deep respect for you. And your name is Michael Smith. Yeah, we're gonna call you Val. <laughs> and because the main character's name is Valentine Michael Smith. So it's mm. like, okay, great. Um, and uh, and he's he, the, the main character. Are, are you familiar with this? I haven't story? read it, no. Oh, so yeah, the basis of Stranger in a Strange Land is the character of Valentine Michael Smith being the sole survivor of a of the first manned mission to Mars. Hmm. But he was an infant when they crashed and he was raised by Martians. Uh, and so brought back to Earth, he has all these amazing psychic powers and this deep kind of wisdom, but he also has an infant's understanding of how to be human hmm. um, as, a, as an adult hmm. being, like all kinds of amazing like magical powers and stuff. Um, hmm. So... So my friends looked at that and went, yeah, we're calling you Val. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, this seems very fitting. Uh -huh. uh, and so over the course of the following weeks or months, um, um, my friends would call the house, and this is back with landlines. So um, they'd call, just, my parents would pick up and they'd say, hi, is Val there? And say, Who's Val? Like, uh -huh. Oh, uh, Michael. Like, yeah, sure, I'll go get it. <laughs> um, then after a while, my parents just learned that my friends call me Val and got used to it. So at some point they just pulled me aside and said, okay, like we've got no problem with it but we just really want to know why do your friends call you Val <laughs> I said well it's short for Valentine at which point my father starts laughing <laughs> because it turns out the reason I was named Michael was after Valentine Michael Smith from the book and and they were actually going to give my middle name as Valentine but there was an objection saying you know Valentine's a really strange name and surely no one's ever going to use it and we don't really want to saddle the kid with all of that. So like, let's, let's not do that. So yeah, so in a, in a, a very particular way, Val and Valentine have been like chasing me literally my entire life. Wow, wow, <laughs> wow, wow, huh. Nominative determinism strikes again. Yes, yeah. Yep. Well. Um, so anyway, so for, for my life story, um, <clears throat> yeah, so my, um, uh, Maybe the, the quirkiest, most relevant place to start in reference here is that my, um, uh, to first approximation, I was raised immortal. Um, my, uh, my family uh, signed our whole family up for cryonics when I was a little kid. Um, there's a little story I can tell in there, but um, along the short of it, it was that I, uh, when I was first starting to recognize that if all beings die and I'm a person, then that means I'm going to die someday. And I was trying to grapple with that. And it was right when I was grappling with that that my parents signed us up for cryonics and said, oh no, you're not gonna die. Like, we think tech will solve this, but like, even if it doesn't, we'll just bring you back. So don't worry about it. I went, oh, okay. And this, this defined my emotional context for uh, until my thirties. Mm -hmm. So wow. um, yeah, and uh, yeah, so my, my whole family had this immortalist attitude very much into uh, transhumanism and um, the, the Kurzweil style, <clears throat> uh, singularitarianism. Um, and uh, just to keep things confusing, they're also really into a lot of uh, more, uh, what's sometimes called Fortean stuff, the uh, like uh, really oddball things like um, parapsychology of telepathy, clairvoyance, recognition, uh, ghosts, UFOs, all that kind of stuff. So there's <laughs> like, it's an interesting to have a clash of that plus uh, Ayn Rand objectivism like being, <laughs> being part of the same household mm. that, that was the environment I grew up in mm. um so um 
yeah. Uh, so like, it, 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 there's more ways than one in which I felt like I was a stranger in a strange land, like growing up and like again referencing Heinlein's book. Um, so uh, there's a lot I can say in the, in the teen range, but I guess, I guess one of the things that one of the things that really defined for me was a recognition of um, death and aging as I just have a very different perspective on it from most people. Um, I, I've, I've come to develop a different perspective even from other immortalists as well. Like I, I think that they've gotten too contracted around calling the usual attitude, oh, death is our greatest teacher and death brings meaning to life. Immortalists really, really get into how nonsense that is and how stupid it is and how obviously we should have anti-aging tech, et cetera. And there's a piece of wisdom that's buried in what they call deathism that they adamantly ignore in the same way that the wider culture adamantly ignores some of the obviously like true caring correct points that I see in immortalism. So I feel like I sort of straddle the two worlds at this point. Um, hmm. and I can sort of, I see both of them and, I'm, and I notice um, there's, there's something in my heart today as a result of this whole arc that it's something like um, humanity uh, has not yet earned its immortality. Hmm. And the process of cultivating the wisdom needed to do that is part of the process of also solving the, the puzzle of the suffering that's associated with mortality. Hmm. That picture seems really clear to me. We can go into it if you like, but um, the, um, so this, but uh, in my teens and uh, 20s, this defined a lot of a kind of uh, activism that defined a huge amount of my energy. I looked at um, it seemed to me incredibly obvious that basically all of the problems that humanity was dealing with came back to uh, an unowned fear of death and an ungrappled with problem with aging. Mm -hmm. That if we could solve those, then, like as, as some quick examples, um, uh, almost everything having to do with, like, by, I, I don't know if it is uh, the largest, but it certainly is a competitor for the largest uh, vacuum of, uh, of resource for economics throughout the world is um, supporting uh, a, the combo of aging populations because like basically the entire medical industry is is focused on like dealing with diseases of aging. If everybody had the health of a 20 year old always, then most medicine would be unnecessary. <laughs> uh, the second thing is uh, um, the cultivation of resources under mortal assumptions, the exponential growth structure of, um, of investments is based on a sense of a need to hurry and the assumption that there is also an end point. So the exponential growth doesn't explode and destroy the system as a whole. Hmm. And the third is the transfer of knowledge across generations as a desperate need because there is this thing destroying knowledge regularly in the form of death. Uh, so if you take a century or two to transfer your knowledge, it's gone. So just seeing all of that and noticing, okay, there's a lot of resources going into being mortal. If we could redirect those resources to, um, uh, to solving other problems, this would be an enormous boost to human capacity. Hmm. So <clears throat> that's just one snapshot of many. Um, so I took a, a lot of activism towards that, um, as a first just trying to push immortalist ideas and then, uh, was trying to more directly attack the problem of, um, the, the mental glitch that seemed that I was perceiving of people assuming death is just good, that immortality is unwise or uninteresting, that there are problems, etc. So <clears throat> that arc eventually... <laughs> it took me through two, two routes. Uh, one was a, a direct attempt to use basically ceremonial magic mm. in style of um, like, a, like the type that Crowley and the uh, Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and all that. Like I, I was trying to use that stuff in order to end aging. Okay. Um, I was, I was uh, working with a group of people who were interested in something similar. It's a small online community for a while. Um, and I think they're still ongoing, but um, uh, they were much more interested in feeling powerful than in solving the actual problem. So I got uh, sort of impatient with them. Hmm. Uh, and then after I gave up on that, um, uh, let's see, 
I'm, I'm describing these in chunks as though this is sequential, but they are, are often overlapping periods of time. Um, I got a PhD in mathematics education hmm. because I was noticing that, I mean, there are multiple reasons. One is that I just love teaching and um, there's a whole thing I could say about math and the beauty of math that there's like, there's a different angle I could take about my life being about math instead of about immortality. But, <clears throat> um, but one of the things I was recognizing is uh, basically every problem that really gets solved gets solved through something like engineering uh, like you um, it, it, it's rare that somebody writes a poem and this transforms society but if somebody like when somebody builds a steam engine for the first time this actually does transform society hmm. and it seemed to me like there was a problem with the way that like I was watching the degradation of creativity and insight and and the ability to solve meaningful problems at a societal level um, this is something that, um, oh, what's his name? He wrote uh, zero to one. Teal? A, yes, Peter Teal, thank you. Yeah, when, when Teal talks about zero to one, um, I think he's, he's talking about the same thing, so like mm. the, the degradation of a kind of creativity in society. Mm. So I was looking at that and trying to see how do I solve that? And it looked to me like part of the problem was that mathematics education had rotted into the ground and I wanted to fix it. Uh, and so I got a PhD in math education. And uh, as I was finishing my PhD, I discovered that field is irrelevant. Hmm. Even if the, um, even if there is, even if I were exactly right and solving math education would do the whole thing, um, it turns out that the actual systemic reasons why math education is terrible um, are uh, gridlocked. And doing more research on how to teach math well has zero effect on the gridlock structure. And the people involved in this can even are often kind of aware of this gridlock, but rather than orienting to that and saying, hey, let's change strategies, there is this whole, I, I remember the meeting where this became clear because I was talking to a bunch of my professors and in a book club. And as they described this thing and I saw the gridlock and I, I paused and said, wait, wait, wait a second. So it seems to me like there's, there's this systemic problem of like the way that politics interacts with uh, mathematicians and interacts with the infrastructure for schools, interacts with the expectations of the teachers and, um, the, uh, um, and the, like, the, the whole system seems like it's, it's gridlocked in this particular way. And math education researchers can't get their things into math ed for these reasons, and it doesn't matter what we research. So what's the plan? Hmm. And one fellow who I have tremendous respect for, and he's like a very, a very grounded guy for the most part. Um, he used to be a middle school teacher and he became a math ed researcher to teach teachers how to teach because he wanted to have a larger positive impact on the kids. Um, he turned to me with this crestfallen look I've never seen on him before. And uh, he said, I try not to think about that because if I do, I get really depressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And everybody else in the room was just like looking at the floor, sort of quietly nodding. And then they changed the subjects to continue talking about some interesting quirks of like how we might be able to do research in these ways. And I was just sitting there like, well, I'm one way, one year away from finishing my PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so abandoned that and uh, that, that's what, um, uh, that led me into starting the Center for Applied Rationality, hmm. um, which incidentally, I, I actually got connected with people in the Bay Area, um, the rationality community, uh, because of the immortalist stuff. I went to a, a young cryonicists conference and there I met Eliezer Yudkowsky who was handing out these little pamphlets about the 12 virtues of rationality, which mm. I was thinking, going, this utterly stupid dude. <laughs> and <laughs> look at how smart I am. And like, okay. And then I read through it and went, okay, yeah, this isn't totally stupid. It's just mostly stupid. This is pretty clever as, as this kind of thing goes. Um, but uh, then I ended up connecting to Less Wrong, um, the website that he runs. And then uh, that connected me to more people there. And that resulted in me, yeah. Uh, Becoming a co-founder for CPAR. Mm. Um, and I could tell that whole story. I, I often felt like I was the historian of a lot of these places because I felt, I, and 
that continues to be a thing that I'm currently doing. Um, that uh, the knowledge of the arc of time that provides the context for what you're doing is part of how you can have orientation to what you're doing. Mm. Um, this is like a, a different way of saying those who are ignorant of history are doing to repeat it, but it's um, uh, it's a very clear thing that I can see and I hold and I have a lot of care for. Hmm. So um, so tracing these things of, oh, this is where these threads seem to come from. So it's uh, something's very alive for me. So ran through CIFAR. The idea with CIFAR was that, um, uh, I mean, the, the community there is obsessed with uh, the death of everything everywhere forever because of artificial intelligence. So we have to do something to get people to think clearly enough to solve um, existential risk from AI. Um, and I was looking at this with a sense of cool, you guys are really obsessed with your apocalypse cult thinking. That's great. I'm looking at this with um, everything is downstream of the combo of uh, I know I'm mortal and it, I know it's horrible and there's nothing I can do about it. So let me distract myself from my own knowing mm -hmm. and shatter my psyche and shatter my worldview so that I don't have to face this and rationalize the entire picture into some kind of, frankly, psychotic. And I, I mean this in a literal sense, like psychosis is like building castles in the sky and living there, mm -hmm. like living in a different reality than your body is in. Um, I could see where there was an actual psychosis that was occurring because of the of, uh, people's refusal to orient to the problem of death. And so I was looking at that going, we've got to build enough sanity and enough of our infrastructure of sanity that people can face this so that we can actually orient to the problems that face humanity. Hmm. So, um, but uh, regardless of whether I was right or the others were right, it seemed to me like increasing sanity was a good thing. Um, spent six years, I think it was, I think it was six years doing that. Um, I think it was tech seven, I think it was seven years. Um, basically uh, started 2012 to the end of 2018. Um, my math is failing me at the moment, but anyway, that's the time period. And uh, that went through a meltdown because of politics. Uh, and so I, I stepped back and went, okay, um, the common element in all of these efforts that keep collapsing is me. Hmm. So let me orient to what about me needs clarification and straightening out so that I can actually orient to what the world needs um, or to what the right question is if that question is itself already distorted with whatever it is. So um, since then, I've been putting an enormous amount of energy into um, a lot of meditation, a lot of inner work. Uh, what I would now say is trauma processing. Um, I didn't have the frameworks for that at the time. I had a huge amount of going to a lot of different um, like plant medicine ceremonies. Like um, I went to uh, Peru and Mexico to, um, to do a bunch of transformative processes there. And um, I, I, I joined a, a group uh, at the time was called Wealth and is now called Electric Yes, which is uh, Carolyn Elliott's I think Carolyn Elliott wrote this book, Existential Kink. She's, uh, she's really into a, this sort of weird fusion of, um, summarize that. she describes herself as a witch. Uh, mm -hmm. She uh, um, totally into uh, hermetic magic. And um, I would say that she also fuses a bunch of um, BDSM reasoning and uh, existential philosophy with the hermetic stuff and mm -hmm. creates this key perspective there. So I was part of that community for, well, technically I'm still part of it, but um, most of the juice of it was uh, um, April, 2020 to around November of last year, 2021, or Christ, 2022. No, this is 2022. Yeah, so 2021, right. It's like my numbers are getting scrambled. Um, and uh, yeah, and I've been, um, since the end of 2020, been, uh, of listening to and working a lot with uh, Perry Chase's material where she puts a lot of focus on coming to a relationship with truth uh, where truth is not a uh, not in terms of a theory of knowing um, but rather uh, like there well oh sorry my phone thinks I'm asking it questions so me... no problem um anyway 
Um, Perry Chase has uh, this paradigm that I found helpful and I continue to find helpful. I still go through, I'm still part of the programs. I consider her my teacher right now. Um, but uh, yeah, so at this point, I've compiled all this stuff following some of Perry's um, suggestions um, and her vision for how to do business differently. She has this whole thing about, um, uh, she describes it in terms of masculine and feminine energetics, but the, I would, I think you could also say left brain and right brain following the in the Gilchrist stuff, if you're familiar hmm. with that. A little bit. Um, um, but the, the gist of it is that she's looking at the world and seeing how the way that culture happens and in particular the way that business happens has this uh, very goal-oriented, performance-focused, extraction-based approach. And that uh, there's a different way of doing business, which she calls the magic led business, uh, that is more about resonating with the truest thing and offering kind of a, almost like an energetic bat signal where you're, you're saying, here is the, the energy. I'm not trying to explain this, I'm trying to show you. And if you feel it, then you are welcome to join. And the details don't matter that much. We'll take care of the details to honor the energy. But the point is, are you in for this? Mm. If you can know that, then we're aligned and then the details don't matter. Mm. And if you can't tell that, then it doesn't matter what the details are. If we do that, then I can serve the energy. You can benefit from the energy rather than me trying to extract resources from you in the form of trying to offer you something to fix you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess I guess there's uh, one one piece of this thread that I I'm, as I'm telling it, I notice uh, this is this is for me a relevant part of the overall arc. That maybe the single biggest thing I got from Perry was um, a recognition of a way of like the way that she frames it is in terms of Cartman's drama triangle, mm. which I'd heard about before, this whole um, victim rescuer um, perpetrator dynamic thing. And um, I had heard of it before, but I hadn't really taken seriously before she had really hammered this, how much I relied on being a rescuer in order to have a feeling of meaning. Mm. Mm. And all of this activism I had done with, uh, with aging and death and trying to save the world and um, like all of that was coming from a rescuer thing where I was projecting my needs onto the world and then trying to fix the world instead of turning inward and being okay in my own skin and then looking at what I want to do and how that does or doesn't mesh with what others are game for. Hmm. So that's been maybe the biggest shift that I've made over the last couple of years, really taking that seriously and internalizing it. Um, I still have a, what, I, what feels like a really vivid image of, I, I can see what kind of shift that the world could make that I would definitely like, and that I think the world would like if it could see it. Hmm. Um, and so uh, I, when, when you sent me the questions earlier and you're asking about global mimetic war and what that's about, uh, this is one way to articulate the thing that I'm seeing about there's, there's a kind of shift that humanity can make um, that um, like I drive a lot with Malcolm Ocean about this kind of thing. He's describing it in terms of the emergent co-intelligence and all of that. Um, but there's a, what I see is a clear shift that could actually address all of this stuff. Um, and I see a lot of the game theory of it and I have a lot of, um, I still have a carry a lot of something like hope that mm. this is a doable thing that might even be able to happen in, in, my normal mortal lifetime. Um, mm. uh, so that's still very alive for me. And a lot of my um, wrestling has been relating to that vision without needing to save the world, without needing to rescue it, but instead being in myself and, and cultivating compassion and like metta and having that be the driver of whatever arises given that I seem to have this perspective. Mm. So at this point, I am uh, building an online business, um, running some programs where I guide people through my best guess at the inner transformations that are needed to allow for this evolution in global human consciousness um, in ways that I can see as I think this is actually helpful for living a good life based on what I have personally gone through. These are the steps that I've experienced so if this resonates with others, then I can guide them through those steps. Um, I'm trying to run this as what Perry would call a magic led business. Um, and that's slowly building. I, I, I just for aesthetic reasons, um, 
but not just for aesthetic reasons, but uh, because it's it's me and it's how I work. Um, I'm, I'm in essence framing this as basically a school of magic, mm. um, uh, but uh, in a very important sense and it's core to how it works. Uh, the, uh, the frame doesn't actually matter because it's about grounding in a direct relationship with one's knowing and using that as the basis for untangling the ways in which we, uh, we use our own panic and anxiety and um, shutdown and nervous system dysregulation in order to um, uh, sort of demand that the world meet our needs and to kind of manipulate it in, and to manipulate others in a kind of um, codependent tangle. So anyway, I could go into that for a long time, but there's um, uh, the, the point being that it, it, the, the frame doesn't matter that much in an absolute sense. Um, uh, what I see as an overall thing is I'm, I'm still trying to do good things for the planet as a whole to the extent that this is good for me mm. rather than as any sense of duty. Um, and certainly I'm trying to, to finish the, um, you know, I, I, I sometimes think of myself as a, a recovering rescueaholic. Mm. <laughs> So trying to like um, uh, fully abstain from rescue a hall uh, while still being able to offer compassion and kindness and support to the world where it, where it seems like that's a good thing for myself and for others. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing your story. There's, there's so much in there. I think um, maybe I'll try to ask about this sort of roughly in the order that you presented them, but um, to start, I'm, I'm very curious about this mix of influences, you know, that was really present in your childhood, what you're talking about of like both the immortalism and, uh, is it Fortianism, you said? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, Fortianism is, is uh, I forget the, I think his name was Charles Ford? Hmm. Oh, Fort, sorry, Fort, sorry, Fort. Fort. Hmm. Uh, God, I, I forgot this stuff. Anyway, it's, it's weird stuff, like hmm. this particular flavor of weird, but yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I'm curious about like in your childhood how those mixed and what your family was like and how they squared those things. And then also it seems like um, al almost like those um, directions of influences seem to persist throughout your life where like on the one hand you got a mathematics education PhD and you're involved in like creating CIFAR and stuff. And then there's also like, you're like trying to use magic to, you know, like end death and like, uh, you're now creating this magic school and stuff like that. And um, uh, I'd be curious to just kind of hear you talk about maybe, maybe generally at, at any scale, whether it's in your childhood or your life overall, like how those different strains seem to be connected and how, how you see them relating to each other. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, so my whole family has always been weird. Mm. Like, like it's been explicitly like recognizing, yeah, we, we, we really identify pretty strongly with the Adams family. Mm. Like in, in like the, the, the live action Raul Julia film is sort of like, that's it, like, it, there's a lot of like weird stuff in terms of like cannibalism and, and, and like almost BDSM stuff that my family does not relate to at all. Mm. But mm -hmm. uh, um, like Uncle Knickknack's winter wardrobe, Uncle Knickknack. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, um, yeah, so there, like we sometimes would joke that, uh, that if our, if our family had a family crest, uh, we would need to translate into Latin what the, the expression at the bottom, no one's ever asked us that before, <laughs> is this is like one of the most common responses my family and particularly my father gets to things that to us seem like straightforward questions, but, mm. um, but coming from an odd enough perspective that we just keep asking and poking at things that turn out to not be things anyone was really into mm. or anyone ever considered before. Mm. Um, like uh, uh, up until, uh, I, th I think my father may have been, he's arguably the most tenacious uh, supporter of cryonics up in, 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 and I think that he may have been responsible for converting more people to actually signing up for having cryonics contracts uh, than anyone up until uh, Eliezer managed to beat people over the head in a large community. Hmm. Um, but it, basically just because dad was pushing this incredibly weird thing and saying, but it makes sense. And he just like, like iron wall of 
like this is sensible so um yeah so uh, yeah so very uh, there's a strong sense of um family unity family coherence and that we are here for each other no matter what I, I feel very lucky to have grown up with that, like having seen that many people just don't have that. They have no idea how to relate to their parents. They often felt like, oh, God, I have to deal with my family. And that's never been an issue for me, just mm. ever. Um, uh, as I've, in, in the last, I don't know, five years, I, um, <laughs> I'm actually laughing a little bit because I, I just realized in my life arc, I didn't touch at all on the entire arc with like Black Lotus or going through a spiritual awakening or any of that, even though that was a pretty major turning point in 2017. But, you know, but since then, um, I've, I've had a lot of reorientation to my parents and recognizing ways in which, um, uh, like I'm starting to get more clarity on the ways in which my family had its own glitches, like everybody does. But mine were different. I didn't, from what I can tell, it didn't, it felt like um, there was, um, uh, I never ever had any doubt that I could turn to my family if I ever needed anything and that they would support me and that, that there was just a thereness. Hmm. So, um, and apparently that goes across many generations that goes back in my father's lineage quite far. Um, so anyway, so they, for these threads, um, I mean, it, it, uh, I'm not sure where the synthesis comes from exactly. Uh, I have always been personally really into uh, like physics. Like I, when I was, I, I have the sense of that I must have been about five, but when I think about my height, when I was having these thoughts, I must have been more like seven or eight. Hmm. Um, but I really loved physics and was devouring everything I could about science because it was, among other things I wanted to build a time machine because mm. uh, I thought that was really cool and my parents are still holding me to that saying so where's that time machine and I said, <laughs> well it'll be any minute now because if it ever happens it's now right uh -huh. so uh um so like the, the two things I wanted to be when I grew up was a physicist and a wizard mm. So it's like the, these threats are from the very beginning. Mm. Um, no one else in my family was really into uh, math or physics or science in any particularly deep way. They really supported me in that though. Um, and um, yeah, it, it always felt like those just, those always braided throughout, um, throughout my consciousness. Um, I guess I'm just reiterating the thing that you said. Yeah, it seems like these threads continue. Um, in the last couple of years, I've gotten a little bit more context on where those threads come from on a civilizational level. Um, one thing that really stuck out for me is that they come from the same place. Hmm. Um, like this, this shows up in things like um, Isaac Newton was an alchemist, like explicitly, he was actually trying to practice alchemy. Uh, it seems very clear that he was familiar with aspects of hermetic philosophy and it strikes me as very likely that a lot of his key insights came from uh, his uh, particularly brilliant way of interpreting hermetic philosophy in contact with the kinds of discoveries that were there at the time. Um, hmm. one, one of my favorite examples of this is how um, we actually knew that the, um, that the heavens operate in elliptical orbits because of um, Kepler's laws of planetary motion. That was there prior to Newton showing up. Um, and, um, uh, but also there was this context of, um, big, thanks to Aristotle's worldview, we were already used to the heavens move differently than, um, things on earth do. So the fact that, um, the things that Galileo was pointing out about the movement of things on inclined planes didn't match up with the elliptical orbits of planets is sort of like, well, we don't know why, but this isn't a big problem because the heavens have always moved differently from earth. Hmm. And, uh, it looks to me quite likely that uh, part of the reason that Newton um, famously watched the apple fall from the tree and looked up at the moon and thought, I wonder if the same thing that makes the apple fall down pulls the, earth, uh, pulls the moon down in the same way. Um, that part of the background for that reasoning was his way of orienting to the principle that now gets articulated as, as above, so below which was mixed in with like hermetic philosophy primarily, but it was also starting to get interbred with alchemy. Mm. So 
Like this is just one piece of many. Like the way that he would talk about the, the fact that he named it the law of gravitation was relating to um, the uh, the way in which um, uh, he his orientation to God looks like it it wasn't standard Christian. It was a fusion of Christian ideas with the Hermetic idea of the like they they use a bunch of different terms for this. Uh, the one from if borrowing from Neoplatonism or uh, Nous or, but, but it's essentially God. I just didn't use the word God for it because it wasn't coming through the Anglo-Saxon language arc. Um, so if you fuse those two together, you actually can see pretty clearly where Newton's vision of God as, um, a, uh, as a sort of law creator and law enforcer might have been very active in his perception. And this is part of his inspiration for doing Bible code stuff. So like, so all of this was already fused together at that time, um, Kermetic philosophy being where we get our, um, our fantasy images of wizards and wands and magic and all of that. That's exactly where that comes from. Um, so uh, in a very important way, science is actually a branch of magic. Mm. Uh, the, uh, the main difference is that um, for reasons that I, I could go into it, but it's not exactly about me. So I'll, I'll try to wrap this up a little bit here. So it's like, here's some historical context that gives me context. But um, uh, the, in the wake of particularly the Reformation, uh, the church was very grabby about its power and was very paranoid and it was in its death throes. Um, and that was just as the scientific revolution was uh, working on taking off. And so one of the deals that um, the, uh, um, the birthing process of science had to make was to say, we're only looking at the physical world where, um, and the church has dominion over the spiritual world. And like, we, we can't, like, the church has um, uh, superior say. So if there's ever any disagreement, of course, the church is right. Um, this is particularly due to Descartes. Uh, it was a little bit before Newton's time. Uh, and this, this provided a kind of context that eventually um, like when, when science started being able to demonstrate its power in a very material way, um, part of the move that it made was to um, uh, was to banish the effect of the church to be able to control things and have narrative say. So this is where a lot of the um, a lot of the skeptic materialist atheist narrative comes from today of, oh, this is stupid and like, like religion is for idiots and um, like we're, we're more evolved than that. This actually came from the European enlightenment. Hmm. There was an attempt to banish the influence of religion so that the ideas of science would have room to grow without having to keep kowtowing. Um, but, uh, part of what happened in that move was uh, the banishment of science as a branch of magic, which was to say, um, like we, the, the concept we have of magic today is is incredibly stupid. Mm. Uh, it's it's made of stupid because it's made of the propaganda of the Enlightenment. the The original context of, for instance, alchemy was this business of uh, self transformation due to the inseparability of observer from observed. And the uh, the reflection of like the, the essentially the fractal view of everything, so that if I am able to understand and work with these materials to create um, a, uh, a a process of this chemical or alchemical transformation, that is going to like my skill with doing that reflects the skill and process of me working on my own soul to return to a more uh, Eden like Garden of Eden like condition. Um, so. It was, it was a wisdom tradition, very much in the style of things like uh, Zen or, um, or Taoism. And the, the move that science made was to say, no, there is a split between observer and observed. And wisdom has nothing to do with observing the physical world and learning how it works. Because of that split that they, that they emphasized uh, of spirit world, physical world. They essentially said the spiritual world doesn't exist and it is irrelevant to cultivate any relationship to it. Hmm. So um, in an important way, science is the result of having borrowed some of magic's power, some of the wisdom tradition of the West's power, and then disowning its heritage. 
mm. and insisting on ignoring the cultivation of wisdom. Uh, which is not to say that it's irrelevant or that there's no wisdom in there. Um, it has to have some, it has to have some relationship to truth to maintain its power. Uh, but I feel like what I am doing now is uh, recombining these threads in a non-stupid way. Mm. Like the stupid way being the way that today people talk about quantum mysticism and quantum physics uh, shows that consciousness creates our reality. And, and uh, you look at, uh, at what uh, um, Dr. Joe Dispenza is saying, he's giving legitimacy to the neurochemistry of, of thought creating what you desire and blah. It's like, it, 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 that, all that's bullshit. The mm -hmm. reason that comes about is because um, the, the social role of priests has moved to um, science and scientists hence things like believe the science as a, an articulation of faith and uh sci almost like saying science will save us it has this 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 quality of turning to uh institutions the way we used to turn to the institution of the church a thousand years ago hmm. and um but there's also a recognition on some level that because of science's banishment of the spiritual world there is a gaping hole in the heart, what some people have referred to a God-shaped hole. And there's a need. It is a deep need, and it's not just a stupid need. It's not a glitch. It is actually a deeply important thing that is this source of where science originally came from, of the cultivation of relationship to truth without presuming your knowledge of what the truth is ahead of time, or even the frame of what the truth is ahead of time. And so, um, a lot of that stuff of like quantum mysticism and so on is people trying to legitimize their pursuit of wisdom within uh, like saying hey look science has given its blessing therefore we can do this and let's ignore the scientists who say that they're not giving our blessing because we really need this to exist that to me is a form of insanity uh, i see a way to rebraid these branches in a way that um honors in its full depth, the power and reality uh, of the scientific frame and its, uh, its capacities and its insight and the bits of wisdom that are, and wisdom traditions still live in that thread. But with the, um, with the aspects of prioritizing the pursuit of wisdom and the cultivation of one's relationship to truth, um, the effect ends up being things that are, because of our Western heritage, it is actually easier to talk about those wisdom tradition things in terms of magic than it is in terms of things like truth or investigation, because truth and investigation now have this cultural connotation of being about scientific inquiry, which already presupposes the absence of the frame that allows for deep spiritual insight. Mm. Mm. Um, so... I don't know if that really answers your question, but that's what, some of the things that come to mind when you when you ask that. Um, yeah, yeah, that's helpful. Um, I'm curious to hear if you can talk about founding CFAR and what your role in that was, and what kind of work you did there during that time. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, a fun quirk is that so I co-founded it with Anna Solomon. We sometimes name other co-founders, but um, I, like the, the, the core of it really seemed to be that Anna was looking for a team and I was the first person to connect with her and help her to build curriculum. And then we started snowballing, which is not to dismiss the, the relevance of people like Julia Galef. And uh, later on, a couple of years later, uh, she named Andrew Critch as a co-founder, which is kind of weird because Critch didn't show up until a bit later. But anyway, um, but uh, so... Uh, the connection that Anna and I formed was because I was doing my PhD in the uh, same math department that her father worked in. Hmm. So, <laughs> again, you know, talk about a kind of quirky determinism. It was like, okay, so in addition to me encountering, encountering Eliezer at this Teens and Twenties Cryonics Conference, it then turns out that where I was working on my PhD in parallel to that had me encountering Anna mm. I'm like okay so like the universe saying go here mm. <laughs> uh that it, um uh, yeah she had showed up at um it, at uh, this is at the um uh, University of California San Diego oh sorry uh sorry that would, it was a, my, my PhD was uh, split between UCSD and uh, San Diego State University 
and it was SDSU where her father was working as a mathematician. And as far as I know, still is. And um, so she showed up to give this talk about, um, well, the, the details don't matter, but it was, had to do with um, uh, strategies for dealing with, uh, uh, with AI takeover. And uh, I came to talk to her afterwards um, saying, yeah, I think this is uh, cool. Um, I, uh, I get the impression that you guys are swamped with people who are way smarter than I am for dealing with this stuff, but um, it was just neat to get to meet you and listen to this stuff. And she said, actually, no, we're not swamped with people way smarter than you or way smarter than anyone for solving this. In fact, we desperately need more people to pay attention to this at all. Mm. Uh, we have maybe three people working on this stuff. And <laughs> it's just like, this gave me the sense of what? Because mm. like I, at the time I had the sense of, okay, it seems to me like the AI thing could potentially be a real problem. But I was pretty sure that the thing upstream of that was the madness from uh, deathism. Uh, and that if part of the reason people weren't looking at this was because they already had a lot of infrastructure for ignoring things that were devastating, horrible, and inevitable. Mm. And they were applying that to the situation with AI. So when she said she barely had any people working on this, despite the fact that a lot of these people were cryonicists, I was looking at this going, uh, that is insane. Mm. So when, when I realized that my PhD program was pointless, <laughs> I, uh, I, I reached out to them and said, hey, so I heard that you guys are trying to build a rationality training organization. My expertise is exactly in education. I don't know that I can really help with the AI stuff directly, but I could help build an engine of sanity. And that fits with my interests because I don't want to die. Mm. <laughs> um, and so uh, uh, from the beginning, um, it was really clear that Anna and I were coming from slightly different points of view because she was single-mindedly focused on how do we stop AI? And I was much more focused on this question of how do we actually cultivate the sanity needed for hu the human race to figure out what it needs to do? If that turns out to be focused on AI, then cool, but I don't want to pre-inject that. If I were going to pre-inject something, it would be dealing with death. Um, it seemed to me like that. I, there, there was a way in which to me, the, the fear of AI destroying everything was obviously a projection of one's own fear of one's inevitable demise and the effort to try to like orient to that being projected onto the world. Like lots of apocalypse cults seem to do this particular psychological move. So I was looking at that going, look, this isn't interesting until you deal with the thing that's inside. So let's create the sanity context for that. Um, but uh, I was also, I didn't understand anything about how power works, political mm. power, social power. I was just like, I have sensible thoughts. Surely if you hear my sensible thoughts, you will agree with me. And we could be like, oh, you're doing things that aren't fair. How about I... I sulk at you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I was uh, far from wise or clever at that time. Um, I just had some neat ideas and I was, um, I've always been a skilled teacher and um, um, had plenty of charisma to carry me through and enjoyed speaking in front of people and uh, could design courses quite well. So, um, I, because of my curricular design experience and from, uh, from my PhD stuff, I really pushed for uh, things like our uh, doing weekly tests of our material, even if we didn't have the material and uh, um, getting feedback from the students uh, and seeing what kinds of impacts this had and having chats with them and sorting out, like, like finding out what the curriculum needed to be in contact with the students. <laughs> and um, and, uh, and I sort of, uh, I, in, in, in an important sense, I built the foundation book for how we do that kind of curricular research. And then also um, later on, I noticed nobody seemed to be interested in building the financial and bureaucratic infrastructure that we needed to exist in interfacing with the government of California and mm. uh, to be able to pay people. Like there's there's this very uh, like wild west loose thing of oh that'll just figure itself out and I was looking at that going yeah because someone sits down and figures it out who's <laughs> going to do it mm. uh, 
I see. I'm the only one that cares. Okay, I guess I will do that. Mm. Um, I was never any good at it, but I, I knew I, I cared. And so I, 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 I put about half or so of my life energy into building that infrastructure as well. <laughs> so I was uh, like the, uh, the admin guy and the, uh, one of the chief instructors and curriculum designers for CIFAR for uh, most of its existence. Um, I, um, I ran into some really massive problems with um, nihilistic depression, uh, particularly, um, uh, I mean, it, it, I thought it was acute in 2015, but uh, by the end of 2016, I had, uh, it had become clear to me that, um, that CIFAR, I, the, the power structure stuff became clear to me and that Anna and I were never going to see eye to eye and that she had power over the organization. Um, and, uh, so I actually became, uh, briefly suicidal at the start of 2017. Um, I didn't actually leave CIFAR until the end of 2018, but that particular arc of going through, um, nihilism and a sense of utter pointlessness and, 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 and very dark depression and suicidality was, um, it, in retrospect, it was a necessary gate for me to go through, to be willing to let go enough to be able to go through um, a, the kind of spiritual awakening that I had later in 2017. Um, that helped me to figure out how to orient to things differently. But um, for, so up until 2016, I was doing all of these curricular roles and so on. Um, and from 2016 to 2018, I was still teaching. Um, I had worked on outsourcing all of the, and automating all of the admin stuff. Um, and I, I became unnecessary to the admin stuff sometime in 2017. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, shortly after my spiritual awakening, I created a whole lot of, um, uh, <laughs> I created this whole sort of sub curriculum within CIFAR that I was running in the workshops that people just started calling the Val arc. Mm. As nobody knew exactly what I was doing, um, but, uh, um, I, I, to me, it was very obvious what I was doing. I was trying to bring people into enough of a clarification of their own relationship to their consciousness and to the ways in which they were, um, like in the relationship between consciousness and mind and the fact that mind is not, like mind, if you aren't aware of your mind, then your mind is running the show. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what you think about that, you can see it. <laughs> so I was trying to show people this uh, and uh, also inject a little bit of heart. Um, in retrospect, I'm re I now recognize that what I was trying to do was um, introduce uh, something like meta, but I, I didn't know how to, and I didn't understand anything about meta at the time. So I was trying to uh, interject stuff about um, being aware of the sense of things mattering and that that mattering is beneath thought and beneath your theories about how the world should work or whatever that it comes first and uh that uh i just got a notice from my earbuds the battery is low so there might be a change in sound shortly um and uh yeah so um uh that sound caused me to lose track of that, where i was going with that anyway um oh right what what, what effect i'm particularly proud of from that is that uh I ended up uh, touching on a bunch of the people from uh, the Swiss effective altruists who um, they were commonly known as being negative utilitarians, which is to say something like on net, they expect, I, this is not honest, their whole philosophy, but one of the implications is uh, a dot, 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 and therefore um, destroying all consciousness everywhere is the ideal goal. Hmm. Um, uh, under, under the idea of something like, uh, it doesn't matter how much good there is if there is still suffering. Uh, and so the only way to get rid of suffering is, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm not doing the philosophy justice, and I'm not trying to, um, but, it, but it goes something like uh, um, positive uh, stuff has no calculus in utilitarian calculations. And that means because you can't eliminate suffering entirely unless you eliminate consciousness, therefore. And so, I was looking at this go like we had this sense of like, do we really want these people being effective? This is mm. uh hmm. 
<laughs> and so um, I got a core cluster of them to get really in touch with an aspect of mattering and compassion. And this seemed to relieve something of a kind of core pain that turned out to be generating a lot of the negative utilitarianism for them. And it was, it, it, last I heard, it, it was successfully creating something like a meta bomb hmm. going off in Switzerland so that uh, a whole lot of people were turning away from negative utilitarianism. Hmm. Like, so I felt really good about that one. Hmm. It's like, ah, let, let's cure your depression. Hmm. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, so I guess that's one way to, to save the, the arc of the whole thing. I eventually um, left at the end in a combo of um, the, uh, the person uh, who guided me through my, my spiritual awakening, Brent Dill, had um, went through, like a, there was a huge social explosion that I, I imagine you know at least some of, um, so you talk to people about the whole Black Lotus thing. Um, but anyway, so there's that whole social explosion, and I looked at it with the way that CIFAR was orienting to it, and I said, yeah, the, if you guys don't change how you're orienting, CIFAR is dead. Mm -hmm. And um, they couldn't, and I, I was emotionally tangled up at the time with the fact that there was all this attack on this person that I had a lot of respect for, and also, uh, I also agreed was kind of dangerous too, but I thought the way people were orienting to it, in, I would now say in terms of attacking him with weaponized victimhood mm. is like, like guys, even if you're right about it being dangerous, attacking him with weaponized victimhood encourages the problem that you are accusing him of having instantiated. Mm. If you don't clean this up, you are going to make the problem on that worse. You are increasing karma. Mm -hmm. Like this is, <laughs> this does not help. Mm -hmm. um, and what they, but, they couldn't hear me as saying anything other than we should be nice to Brent mm. and we shouldn't kick him out of the community. Uh, and I think they were interpreting this as, well, well now we have to get rid of Val. Mm. And it's so it's like, so when we hit that wall, I was like, yep, I'm done. And they said, yep, we're done with you. I'm like, mm. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's done. Mm. <laughs> so we, we cleaned up our relationship a decent bit uh, this last October, me and CFAR. Um, um, but uh, I still think that they were significantly off in terms of their orientation on a, on a spiritual level for, um, for that whole mess. Uh, so, anyway, so that was, that was my whole arc throughout hmm. all of that. Hmm. Um, hmm. This feel, this feels salient to mention kind of from my perspective of, um, I remember reading your Kensho post maybe, I don't know if I read it at the time you posted it, but maybe after, because you and I were corresponding a bit, I think in early 2018, uh, which would have been, you know, it sounds like maybe six months after your experience or whatever. And yeah. I think, um, how to put this? I talked I talked to a lot of folks on the show that like uh, have some kind of experience with awakening and they'll talk about that explicitly or implicitly and, um, I don't know, it's something that I'm continue to be very curious about, like what people are referring to and what their experiences are and how that maps on to my own experiences because I've you know, never really considered myself to be awakened or have one of those experiences. Um, but anyway, I remember reading your post and uh, how to put it. I think, I think, so I think the way that I have historically conceived of awakening precluded anyone from ever saying that they're awakened and uh uh so when people do say they're awakened like for a long time that was very triggering for me and it was like kind of suspicious it was like why is this person saying this thing that they wouldn't say like they must be lying you know and um i i guess actually maybe maybe ingram was the first person that i read that was like yeah i'm awakened and i've had this experience or whatever and um i don't know there's there's this sort of like interest and like, well, maybe they are. And like, what, what are they saying? And then also like, oh, they must be lying. And uh, I don't think I thought at the time you're lying, but there's sort of this, like, I, I think it was one of the first examples I remember of like reading someone saying, no, I've actually had this experience and this is meaningful to me. And like, you know, this is good and whatever. And um, yeah, I think of course, since then I've talked to lots of people who are like, yeah, you know, that's a thing I've done it or whatever. And um 
anyway, it, it, it's, at the time it surprised me that, and, and one, one that someone was writing about, but two that was on less wrong because I don't know, I think I still probably have this sort of like straw rationalist in my head, but the straw rationalists were not interested in awakening or mysticism or, or, or practice or things like that. And um, yeah, I wonder if you could just talk about your experience that you had and what precipitated it and, and say more about that. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, if, if for what it's worth, my my sense, uh, even at the time, agreed with yours of, um, like certainly in terms of oh, like the straw rationalist thing. Mm. Part of the reason I did that was because I was trying to punch the egregore of less wrong rationalist in the face mm. and saying, look, you claim to be for truth. <laughs> How about this? <laughs> you know, and, and, um, and I uh, and I, I also really like. I was trying to be a, a reasonably careful, but I also was still carrying a lot of charge in my system, and there's still threads of that charge in me now. Like, I, like there's, there's still little bits of defensiveness that show up with respect to the rationalists, mm -hmm. and there's this quality of me coming in with this bit of look. I'm going to try to be sensible, but you fuckers aren't going to listen, are you? Mm. And uh, but I'm going to hide that that sense of condemnation and just explain <laughs> things, right? And, and to, so I think that if you if you reread that post, you may catch some of that energy in there, and particularly in the replies that I was making. Interesting. Um, I think that added a lot of combativeness in the overall conversation that happened there that didn't need to be there in some sense, but I had to work through it, mm. uh, and in some ways I'm still working through it. Um, although it's I, I, I'm at this point I'm pretty clear that I can be clean and hold myself in a conversation with rationalists about this stuff. But um, I'm also uh, I'm also delighted that that particular post, Kensho, uh, seemed to really kick off a whole arc of conversation about enlightenment type stuff and awakening in that community in a way that had people sort of orienting to it. And I still feel like they're missing something important, but, um, but I think they're actually trying. And that's mm -hmm. really good to see. So, um, but uh, one thing I should say is that even at the time, and I still hold this, uh, I didn't think I had attained full awakening enlightenment. Um, so the uh, the experience, I'm, I'm still a little confused about what exactly, how exactly to classify the experience, because the, the whole like Vipassana map, I, it's like depending on whose version of the map I'm looking at, it's different things. like. Uh, um, Daniel Ingram said, oh yeah, that's the A&P. How do you know? Because it's lots of woo, 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 woo. Mm. But I mean, but also uh, in comparing notes with, um, with several other people, one person thinks, no, that was actually um, completion of second path. Mm. And I'm like, and he gave some solid arguments and um, he was like, okay. Or at the very least stream entry. Why? Because here are some details. Okay. I don't know what this was but I do know what I experienced mm -hmm. and that it had a profound effect and that the profound effect made a huge amount of spirituality and mysticism make enormously more sense such that there is an absolutely clear before and after. There's mm -hmm. no question. And I think it would be fair to describe it as something like, oh, I was sleepwalking and now I'm awake mm -hmm. in a particular way. But part of the experience included an element of, I could see exactly like there, there was absolutely no doubt in the in the midst um, in the midst of the experience itself that um, I could see what the Buddha was talking about, that I had not embodied the full thing yet, and that there was a lot farther to go. But now I could see where I'm going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like absolutely crystal clear in that sense. Um, and most of that has still stuck around. It turned out that uh, in terms of, well, what are the next steps? That part turned out to be much harder than I had thought in the midst of the experience. So uh, the, the lead up to this um, was actually Brent helping me through a lot of my own inner struggles, me sorting out my, um, uh, my uh, depression and sense of uh, nihilistic hopelessness. I didn't recognize it as nihilistic hopelessness exactly, but it was, um, but looking back, it's pretty obvious that's part of what was going on. Mm. Um, that my mind had come to a lockdown on something that was false and that was violating things that mattered to my heart. Mm. But I couldn't get out of it because I was used to using my mind to tell me what to do next. So never encountered anybody telling me something as simple as that. 
Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> but uh, but uh, Brent uh, guided me through a whole lot of uh, intense experiences, some including using psychedelics uh, that sort of, like, he kept saying, this is, this is one thing that still strikes me as uh, when people talk about, oh yeah, Brent was a really powerful figure and but like, like, like lots of cult leaders, he had these kinds of issues. Oh, my, uh, my earbuds just died. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can. Okay. Let me just sort it out something here because I think my my earbuds are arguing with their own charger. Okay. Okay. So um yeah, so yeah, it sounds so different hearing myself about the sound canceling. Um yeah, so when people are are um talking about Brent as uh like very smart, but very broken and uh, emphasize the brokenness and all of this glitchy stuff. It seems to me like there's a dimension of, of what his power was that, um, that gets skipped over because it's almost, it's almost like there's this uh, social need in this kind of context to emphasize uh, like when, when someone is a problematic cult leader, you need to emphasize the problematic part and the bad part of cult. Mm -hmm. rather than well why was their appeal and where is the source of power oh it's because they were screwing with people's heads in those and such way well okay but where is the power to screw with people's heads mm -hmm. and the, the, the piece here that keeps getting missed mm -hmm. this seems to me endemic of the of the whole orientation to why people are so scared of cults and going oh is is less wrong a cult is is, th is this a cult is that a cult like okay what you're asking is um what is the power and should i be scared of it Hmm. but you're asking through a cultural trauma that we haven't oriented to. Hmm. So um, Brett was doing things like uh, naming how, when he was guiding me through some of these processes as I was going into them, uh, he would say, uh, yeah, and like, because I, I, um, I'm totally happy to do this, both because it seems like you, you could really use this right now, but I really like the Val that I'm going to get because I was going hmm. by Val at the time. Actually, I, I stopped using the name Val or Valentine when I left the rationality community for reference um but uh anyway he's so saying i really like the the version of val that i'm going to get in about four months hmm. right and i was like i don't know what you're talking about like, that's okay you'll see you'll see hmm. Hmm. what is this and then four months later wham that was the ken show hmm. wow right? so um like it's stuff like this if he knew what was going on and a shocking level of detail hmm. in terms of these kinds of transformations. And he was able to time it exactly. Hmm. So, okay, so what was that? That wasn't hmm. just screwing with my head. He actually, he helped me to evolve in a way that I am immensely grateful for. Hmm. Um, and he had that kind of uh, control and perception over it. Um, this was a lot of why I, uh, I ended up being so um, close to and supportive of him for the approximately remaining year after that of us uh, working together. Um, it's because I could see, well, yeah, this, this guy is really fucked up in a lot of ways, but that power is real. And he clearly, like he's, he, I can watch him using it in order to, to the best of his ability through his, his glitchy filter, to the best of his ability actually trying to help people. Hmm. Uh, so we're like okay um so uh the experience itself um this is at burning man uh brent had told me um he'd been telling me for a while but he really emphasized this thing at this point of um hey, you don't seem to know what real is i'm like okay well if i don't know what real is i wouldn't know would i but yes i but but i was frustrated about things like uh, i would try to speak perspectives and it would land on deaf ears, or I would try to make something happen and it wouldn't stick. Um, and he was saying, yeah, that's because you don't know what real is. Mm -hmm. So let's do a, a really deep ceremony here. And uh, I will do my best to show you what real is. And so we, um, we did this whole uh, walkthrough of, um, of uh, a deep playa at Burning Man. And um, like the, uh, the, I'm noticing myself editing some pieces because I'm, I'm not quite sure what the implications are of describing all of the details of what was going on. So just note, there's some things that I'm not gonna go into here. 
um, just because of the, the, the recording medium. Um, but uh, in the course of us having this conversation, framing things mythically, uh, I was able to enter a kind of um, trance. And part, part of the context is relevant for this is that my father is a hypnotherapist. Hmm. So like I grew up knowing some of like how to like alter my consciousness in a particular sort of way. I wasn't sure how to use it, but here I could sort of alter my consciousness in a particular way and open up and, um, and Brent was acting as my guide through that. And then at some point there was some kind of shift that happened where I realized that I couldn't think clearly. Like I would try to put my thoughts together and then it was almost as though my, my mind would fall on the ground and shatter and then I would pick up pieces and then it would do it again. Hmm. There was just, I could not think. And at that point, Brent had, um, like we had been sitting down at that point in, in deep playa, it's like far from where all the noise and lights are. So it's this sense of being in vast space. And he said, great, now we can begin. Hmm. And he guided me to look him in the eyes and he just kept saying, all right, and here is now. But that moment's passed and here it is. here's a new now. And here is now again, and now, and now. And there was something about, um, I, I remember looking right at his left eye in that moment and I could feel a kind of, almost like there was a membrane that I was really familiar with, but I hadn't noticed before. I still am not quite sure exactly what that membrane is. I, I think it's something like my mind's way of constructing an impression of being in the world, but the fact that that's mind, it's not world. And I, but I could feel something like, uh, like a, an extra bit of mass and sharpness in my concentration. And I was able to sort of push through the membrane. And I felt sort of like I fell through a pinhole that uh, went through his left eye in some sense. It was like a, an odd visual experience. Uh, and then I entered something that I know I don't remember all of it. Uh, but there is this vast experience and calling it an experience is awfully, awfully strange, but it was an, an intense something that um, some of the, the, the way that my mind has grabbed onto this and provides some images uh, suggests something like I was in an infinite space that I had always been in, hmm. um, that I recognized it. It was like a kind of remembering. And I was with everything, every, everything everywhere all at once. Like hmm. it's the, <laughs> um, infinitely peaceful, also infinite sensation. It was literally everything uh, outside of time. I didn't, I, I, at that point, I didn't fully take in the outside of time thing, uh, but I could tell there was an absolute clarity of knowing after spending eternities there, um, there's an utter clarity that I would come back into this human in a few moments. You know, that, that meaning is kind of broken when you're outside of time, but like after coming back into time, that means something. And I knew I was going to come back and that I could choose something I was bringing back in, but that the human would not be able to integrate everything. There was no hope of integrating everything. So I could choose something. And one thing I chose to bring back with me is these memories I'm telling you now. Um, there's also a, a piece of wanting a path back to clarity to, to maintain something of a link so that I, I could cultivate returning and stabilizing a return there. Um, return being kind of a funny term for this, but so, so um, all this being framed in terms of after coming back, this is how I can talk about it. <laughs> um, but uh, when I came back, for lack of better terms, um, there is still this infinite vastness withness I found myself wanting to hold very still and to be very careful about how I tried to think hmm. because I could tell that I could boot up my mind and start doing clouding things again. And I didn't want that. I wanted to actually take this thing in all the way. Um, so after I, I, my, my sense of time was really broken, but after a while, a few minutes, I think, of just sitting there in stillness, um, 
uh, he and I cultivated our own language. What I, the, the first words that came out of my mouth were, I am the avatar. Hmm. Um, but, but what, what the, the um, uh, a way to translate that, this is ref a reference to the role-playing game Mage the Ascension. Um, what I was trying to say, um, I've now, I, I still am very with, and this is, um, and it, it's become much more stable in my ongoing experience. Uh, that it's not that I have a higher self. It's actually that I am the thing that the machinery that is the human refers to as the higher self, that I have a lower self and that is it. Hmm. And that machinery has a name for me. Okay. So it was, a, it was an important kind of frame shift because up to that point, I hadn't even realized I was thinking of the higher self as something I petitioned in order to get help in order to live my life instead of recognizing, oh. So there was a ton of uh, experience I can go into here. I could probably spend hours talking about all of the nuances and some of the transformations that happen. So in the following couple of hours, um, Brent and I continued to talk, but I was staying very in tune with this vastness and this, uh, this sense of it felt like I had plugged into something and then there was an electric current that was going through me. This is the part that Ingram was saying, oh, I, I, that's A and P. Okay, mm -hmm. great, this is A and P. Um, but it was becoming, I, I had this sense of looking through my mind with an utter clarity that I was seeing my mind and seeing the world and, and, uh, and noticing these ways in which I had misunderstood a lot of signposts for spirituality and that there were a bunch of signposts that were spiritual things of saying, hey, remember, or hey, go this way, that I hadn't even recognized as spiritual at all. Mm -hmm. They just, they seemed like they were mundane or secular. So my vision snapped into a different configuration. It still is absolutely with me. It, it felt like that was a basic shift that happened in my mind. And my mind can pretty reliably sort this out much better than it was able to before. Not mm -hmm. to say it's perfect, but, and I bet there's still tons of stuff I'm missing in both of these ways. But um, it, was, uh, it was a dramatic transformation in terms of my ability to see what was going on in, with sort of spiritual eyes. Um, and uh, it also felt like I got to consciously experience what relating with other humans is in some sense for the first time. Um, in this quality of the way in which I am something like an angel sent into a human body and that I'm remembering my angelic nature for a, for a metaphor. Um, I could see the angelness of others and I could see what would be involved in doing something that is more like a real connection and the ways in which I had been not available for that because of the way I've been sort of wearing this mechanical, the, the sort of mech suit of largely mind, but also trying to puppet my body in a particular way, um, using a bunch of autopilot programs. Hmm. So there was like a couple of hours of digging through all that and, and sorting through the consequences as I was dealing with the peak of that experience. And in some sense, I've been integrating that ever since. Um, but um, yeah, so that was, that was the, the, the peak moment there. Hmm. The stuff that led up to it. I know that you mentioned that after that at CIFAR, you're sort of recreating what was called the Val Arc. And then, you know, now in your current work, you're like creating this school of magic that's like designed to help people have the shifts that they need to um, sort of show up for the transformations that are needed in the world. And I'm wondering how you think about what's needed to have these kinds of experiences, like what, what precipitated your own experience and how are you trying to help other people have similar shifts? Yeah. Um, uh, I find my thinking changing a lot over time. The mm -hmm. way that I'm currently thinking about it, I'm, I'm still trying to find a way to articulate this nicely. But I actually made a tweet about this uh, fairly recently. Um, there's, 
there's a place to stand that is, uh, I want to say something like outside of all sensation. Um, that it feels like the act of standing there helps to cultivate it. It's like building an extra body or something like that. Um, I mean, sometimes like Perry Chase will uh, talk about uh, having mass. And I sometimes think of this as spiritual mass. I think we're talking about the same thing. Um, in some uh, esoteric traditions, there's a talk about having to build your soul. Like you're not born with an immortal soul. You have to create it so that something, there is something there that can survive death. Um, I don't know about the models of surviving death or whatever, but the um, but there's an, it, there's something that I hesitate to call it an experience, but for lack of a better term, I'll say there's an experience of landing on something inside that is core. That if as you cultivate that kind of stability, it gives you a place from which you can make other edits, you can make other adjustments, you can shift things. So. Um, like in my own experience, I can now look back and recognize, like I often will say that the, this, this kind of, the, the, like I haven't really named the whole thing by any means, the, the main program I run is called Mage, but I feel like that's the, um, that's like the, the foundations course and I'm starting to build others that touch on things that I think are beautiful or interesting or important. There's another one that I'm in the process of creating that's currently called Immortal that is very much about orienting to death and eternity in a what I think is a very deep way. Um, but for whatever this whole thing is, which I'll just keep loosely calling the school of magic, um, the, uh, the, I'm building the thing that I really wish had been there for me when I was roughly 12. I don't know if, it, if I would ever welcome 12 year olds, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm looking back at, there was a lot of difficulty I was running into and looking back, I can see a lot of the difficulty was um, there were a lot of um, trauma structures that had been embedded in my body that I didn't know how to orient to because the nature of those traumas had me relying on my mind mm. for guidance for everything so much that I didn't have any place to stand in order to orient to moving the trauma at all. Mm. So, um, and then it didn't matter what I read or learned about, and I, I've been gifted with a brilliant mind um, so, and I, I, I say that just as like, okay, here I am having genes. That's great. I, 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 I have nothing to do with that. I was just a recipient. I'm, I'm grateful for this tool. Um, but in, in a particular way, it was also, um, I, I, I hesitate to say it was a curse, but it was, um, it did a really good job of being something I could rely on. Mm. So I didn't notice how bad this was for a long time. Mm. Um, and uh, so I would try to read and understand all these different theories and try different ideas and different frameworks, but it was all, it was, it was vaporware. It was all made of, it, it's like trying to figure out how to program code that will bring you your lunch. Hmm. It's like at some point, like, like the easiest thing to do is notice, oh, I am a human, not a programmer. I can stand up and go to the kitchen. Hmm. There's something really foundational like that, that I kept missing. I say this despite having like a strong background in martial arts, I was really emphasizing a lot of uh, meditation and embodiment stuff to the best that I could. But the thing is that I was doing that because it made sense and I was still following the dictates of my mind and my mental instructions. There is something deeper than all of that that is what knowing is. So like th this is the quality of, uh, for instance, the contrast between, did you know that if you unwind all the DNA in each of your cells and you put it end to end, it would reach from here to Jupiter and back several times. Hmm. They're like, well, if it turns out, oh no, actually it doesn't reach all the way to Jupiter, it just goes to Mars. It's just like, okay, great. So there's some factoid floating around that you can shift and twist in different ways. Um, but this contrasts dramatically with something like you can feel your tongue in your mouth. And if I say, oh, wait, no, it turns out that that's not true. It's like, well, okay, I don't know what kind of bullshit you're going to say. Maybe you're going to reframe it and that turns out not to be my tongue or whatever, but those are the thoughts. I do know I am having this experience. And there's, like, you can, you can get into philosophical traps saying, well, what does no mean in this case? And what exactly are you talking about? And what precisely is it that you know? But there's a way where that's, that's bullshit after the fact. There's still a ground that you're standing on. So 
orienting to that ground, which if you want to think of it as sensory, direct sensory information as a starting point, that's okay, but it's deeper than that. It's the place from which you can even know that you are having sensory experiences. So cultivating that as a place to stand, deepening that makes it so that it is possible to not be relying directly on what the body is currently doing, what the sensory information currently is, what the mind thinks. Instead, you can stand on, this is true. And from the, this is true, there's room to start noticing things like, okay, can you cultivate more body awareness? When you cultivate body awareness, you can start to sense energy a little bit more in detail. And you can start to notice how the energy creates thoughts and the way that the thought and the body, that the mind and the body create these loops. The loops are fueled by this kind of energy. You can start to observe this. And the more you observe it, the more your mind can become helpful as doing something other than reinforcing this cycle, but can actually start to notice, oh, here's the exit for that loop. Oh, let me, I missed it. Let me try again. Okay, I managed it that one time. Uh, here I try again. Oh, I missed it that time. Okay, now I do it again. All right, now I can see that exit. Let me train that exit. I care. And so over time, you can start to unwind these patterns and then more and more of the system becomes available for unwinding more and more of these patterns. Mm -hmm. That makes it possible to do things like um, notice the structure of memetics as they flow through your mind and through others' minds. Um, and to, uh, in particular, like I think this is an instantiation of memetics, but it's also uh, really foundational for being able to do any of this stuff, to notice the ways in which people intertwine in what I've come to call co-manipulative patterns, hmm. where um, if, if I can't be okay unless you are a certain way, and you can't be okay unless I am a certain way, and there's a weird way where we can do a sort of trade where, well, what if I'm not okay unless you're okay and vice versa? So now I can bid for you to do the things I need you to do by threatening you with my upset. And that's fair because you can do the same thing to mm. me. We'll call this caring. Mm. <laughs> mm. This, is, this is the foundation of most of how we do culture. Mm. So noticing that loop in detail, not as an abstraction, but noticing precisely, oh, here's how I engage. Oh, here's what the bid looks like. Oh, this is where I get hooked. This is where I'm trying to hook others. And here's the exit. Let me practice the exit. Oh, this means I now can't regulate by saying, look, look can't, can't you just like, like get me the, the apple or mm. whatever? Like instead, you can start to notice, oh, I'm demanding that the world regulate me instead of me cultivating the ability to regulate myself. Mm. How do I come into center? And the answer is largely based on standing in that place of stability, that place of deep knowing and cultivating everything anchoring back in that place. It turns out that uh, if all people did, just as a matter of game theory, if all people did was um, make it so that they can take responsibility for their own regulation and choose to do so. And then interact with others, not in a, with, with zero sense of I need you to do this in order for me to be okay. And instead it was, look, I will take care of myself, but here's something I would enjoy doing with you. Would you enjoy this as well? If so, great, we can dance. And if not, that's cool. I may be disappointed, but that's my responsibility to take care of. Mm. Regardless of how people frame it, if, you, if, if that were the basis of culture instead, it creates a different um, attractor from the co-manipulative one. The co-manipulative one makes everybody's okayness dependent on one another, which means no one is responsible for the whole system. No one can be responsible for the whole system. And so you end up with this distributed computation where, yeah, we're together, but we're together in a boat that no one's steering. This other one is also a, um, a game theoretic, I um, uh, uh, forget the term for this, but, it, but it's, a, it's a, a sync up point. It's a stable point in game theory. And in that one, you still don't have any individual steering the ship, but the co-intelligence that arises between people syncing up ends up being something that 
has more coherence and a capacity to account for much more context. So you can end up with a, um, technically you can end up with the super exponential explosion in coordinated intelligence. Um, there's, there's some mathematical details about what exactly that means, but uh, it means that instead of having to have institutions enforcing rules to make people behave in certain ways under threat, you can instead have an ongoing dynamic evolution where, yeah, nobody gets to know what the full structure is at any given time. And we can't know that it's going to stay any particular way, but we can know it will be the kindest, most intelligent thing that can be given all of the pieces that we are capable of accounting for. And that it's attempt to account for what each person needs will improve over time because that's what it's made of. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't, um, I, I've learned to uh, let go of any responsibility for or clinging to trying to save the world with this kind of vision, but the vision itself is clear and I can recognize, I can at the very least create a social atmosphere around myself that is more like the sovereign um, kind collectively wise thing. And that is what I'm trying to do. And that's what I'm inviting others into. So hmm. uh, I, I, I lost track of exactly what your question was. All this feels related. But hopefully that, <laughs> that starts yeah. to touch on the thing you're asking about. Yeah, I think you answered it. I'm um, finding myself curious about, I, I think I lost something in there about like, I could kind of track your saying like, oh, if, if one person has this shift, then they're interacting uh, differently with people and their experience in the world. And that's a good thing. And then um, how does game theory start to fit in such that it becomes possible to have these larger shifts culturally? Well, the, one of the main pieces is that um, it, is, it is in fact to each individual's advantage to make this kind of shift. In, in some sense, that's tautological because it's defined to be the shift that would do this. But there's, there's some detailed structures as to why the sovereign thing will do that. Um, uh, I, I find myself not wanting to go into all the details about it right now, but because mm. I, I could ramble for a long time. Mm. Um, and uh, there's some pieces here where I feel like it could use a little extra detail that I want to finish thinking through. Maybe um, so maybe to reframe the 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 question then to kind of like limit it a bit. Um, most most teachers, most spiritual teachers that I've encountered don't talk about game theory. I do think there is this sense of like, um, I think most spiritual teachers that I've encountered have this sort of sense of like, yeah, it would be good for society as a whole if like we all did the thing that I'm pointing to and that other people are doing. And so that's, that's not unusual, but um, specifically framing it in terms of game theory, I think is a bit unusual. And um, I wonder if you could say like something, I mean, cause, cause basically I know almost nothing about game theory. And uh, I wonder if you could say kind of like the minimum viable bit of game theory that's like relevant to understand sure. the proposal you're making. Sure. Um, yeah, so the following is not, uh, not especially, uh, I, th I think the following will give a, will give a good snapshot. Um, I imagine some people who are really into game theory will say, hey, well, this is not quite right for reasons X, Y, Z. And like, okay, great. I'm, like this, this margin is too small to contain full proof. So please bear that. Yeah, you're just speaking to Tashin right here, who's who's a total <laughs> noob to this sort of thing. So, so are you familiar with the prisoner's dilemma? A little bit, but spell it out just in case someone isn't. Okay. Yeah. So in the prisoner's dilemma, um, the idea is that you have uh, two prisoners who are caught, uh, who who are, who are conspiring on doing a particular kind of crime, who are caught and separated and being interrogated by the police separately, and the police are giving them. Um, separately this deal. Um, so if you're one of them, the police officer is saying, look, we've got enough to convict you both. Um, the thing is um, that we, um, uh, we're missing, we can't land you with everything. Okay. However, uh, if you, if you uh, rat out on all the details so that we can convict you with everything, here's the, the deal that we'll make. We'll let you get off um, uh, we won't convict you as hard as we would have if both you and your partner say nothing, okay? But your partner will get really devastated. Like, so this is something like we could get put you in jail for, we could put you both in jail for three years, but you only get one and he'll get 10. 
hmm. if you're willing to rat, okay? Um, you also know in this case that your partner is getting the same deal. Hmm. Right? Um, but you don't know what uh, they're deciding. Right. Now, if both of you uh, make a, if both of you rat, then uh, both of you get something like five years. Hmm. Okay. And I, I may be doing the math wrong, but the point is that uh, if you if you orient to this in a very logical fashion, you know that um, well either your co-conspirator will rat you out or they won't. If they don't, you are better off ratting because then you like, you only get one year instead of the three. If um, they do rat you out, then you're better also ratting out because then you only get five years instead of ten. Mm. But they're thinking the same way, which means that the convergent effect is for both of you to admit everything and end up with five years of jail, even though obviously you would both be better off saying nothing and only getting three years of jail. Hmm. Okay. That's the prisoner's dilemma. You can monkey with the numbers, but the point is that lot, if you follow um, individual logic to its natural conclusion, you end up with a situation that is obviously worse in a global sense. And a lot of, um, the reason this is relevant is that an awful lot of social structures are meant to deal with the prisoner's dilemma and things related to it. Um, uh, uh, one, is, is one, uh, uh, one kind of example is that, well, if you're going to do um, several rounds of prisoner's dilemma, but, but say you're gonna keep playing prisoner's dilemma over and over again where you're, uh, where you're either winning or losing money based on what your partner does. Um, and uh, they, then you know that there is a consequence to you defecting. Okay. So there's some incentive for you to cooperate, even though it's in your interest in that round to defect, because you, on net, if you, if you know that you're going to do some number of rounds, 20, give or take five, you want at least the very first few to be ones where you can both benefit. Hmm. Okay. So, um, the, uh, so that's part of the game theory behind things like uh, caring about long-term relationships that you have with people in a situation where if one of you were to act sociopathic, they could really win out really well, but now you've ruined the relationship and now there's going to be consequences. Mm -hmm. So from a game theory point of view, um, the reason for those consequences is to act as a disincentive so that you can successfully have cooperate, cooperate as the thing you converge on in any given instance of a game theory or in any given instance of a game theoretic um, prisoner's dilemma. Um, so the, from my vantage point, um, one way that you can solve the prisoner's dilemma in a way that creates convergence on cooperate, cooperate is for instance, to identify with the system instead of as the prisoner. If you identify as the system as a whole, and I don't think I did the numbers right because I made up the numbers off the top of my head, um, but uh, in, in lots of maybe most uh, prisoners' dilemmas in practice, uh, the system as a whole ends up um, uh, net positive with everyone cooperating and net negative with everyone defecting. So in that case, you end up with wanting to choose cooperate if you can, because you want the system as a whole to be well. Mm. Right? And a loose analogy here is something like uh, from meta, when you cultivate enough meta, there's this quality of, well, it doesn't matter if like, right, great, I could become a millionaire if we're willing to let a village in Africa die. Mm. Uh, I mean, no. Mm. And it's and like and there, like maybe we could do some like effective altruist style thinking of is the million dollars worth the lives and blah 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 but no yeah and, and so I think part of what Meta is doing there is causing you to recognize on a meaningful level that you are you are correctly better identified as the system as a whole rather than just Tashin mm -hmm. right? and that means that when you're put in prisoners dilemma type situations you are more inclined if you can, to choose cooperate. Mm. The place where this strategy gets screwed up is if you're dealing with somebody else who doesn't think that way, they're gonna defect. Mm. And now if you cooperate and they defect, 
you may in fact end up in a worse situation even for the system as a whole than if you were to defect as well. Fascinating. So one really key element of this is not just naively identifying with the whole system and therefore being nice. It is wisely identifying as the whole system, including tracking how much of the other you can come to understand. Hmm. No sense of punishment, no sense of, hey, that wasn't fair, because that's enacting the local ego version of um, solutions to the prisoner's dilemma, which results in no one being responsible for the system converging on something good. You end up with rules being responsible for that. But if you want to be responsible for it, and you want to participate in the creation of something that is intelligent and wise, holding the entire system with compassion, then <clears throat> um, you need to, it becomes very important to cultivate skill with understanding the game and understanding the other and recognizing whom you can actually do this kind of coordination with, where you can actually trust them with a prisoner's dilemma type situation such that you both know you will converge on cooperate. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for explaining that. Um, I can see how there'd be a lot deeper to go into that, but I, I feel like that's a really good starting point. So um, I want to, so I have um, many other questions I'd like to ask you, but uh, we won't have time today, unfortunately. So I'll maybe just ask one more question and then we could wrap up there, which is um, you and I have spoken on Twitter before about uh, your or maybe you were speaking to someone else. In any case, you've written on Twitter about your experiences with Meta and that sort of shifting for you at some point. And you know, you've made several yeah. allusions to that in this conversation. And so I'd be curious to hear more about your experience of Meta and like what shifted for you and hear you reflect on that. Yeah, um, that was actually just earlier this year. I think it was the end of January. Mm. I, I, I made a pivotal shift. Um, it, in, it wasn't as profound as the thing that I experienced with Brent. Um, but that was sort of the mental version, and this is the heart version. It was a, it was a very clear before and after in the mm. same kind of way. Um, so uh, before January, I had this bit of game theory in mind, and I could see where it was really important to cultivate a sense of uh, expansive caring holding for the whole system, and that uh, self-care was part of that. Um, like even in the game theory thing, you don't want to identify as the system instead of as the individual, because it, it's, it, there's still something very real about the fact that you're acting through a particular individual and not others. And that part of the reason there is any benefit at all is because the benefit is being received through individuals. So the ability to appreciate the benefit at all comes from also being able to identify as the local. Hmm. So there's, there's a paradox there to hold in part of the, this, this whole uh, metagame but this, this tack on game B is to hold this paradox as parallax and come to be able to have a vision as both the whole and the individual. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> so I was aware of that version being applied to the heart stuff of, um, it's important for me to be kind to myself and to, for me to care about being nice to myself and for my own flourishing. Uh, as well as the flourishing of all beings. Like both of those in this kind of parallax form needs to be there. But I have this edge to it of, and if I don't, I'm fucking up. I'm contributing to the problem. Oh shoot, there I'm beating myself up. Okay, okay, I need to meditate now. Let me let me go practice meta, all right? May, may, I, may I be happy? May I, and it, it's sort of, it had almost this Calvinist tone in the background of, okay, let me atone for the sin of being mean to myself. Mm. And I was conscious of this, but I couldn't do anything about mm. it mm. because the consciousness was itself reinforcing the loop. Right. Um, so the stage had already been set for understanding that I wanted this, but uh, at the end of January, um, I did a breathwork ceremony. Uh, it was actually in one of Perry Chase's containers, um, uh, although it wasn't aimed at doing this. This is incidental. Like I had all these pieces cooking and then I went through this breathwork ceremony and then I had this intense visionary experience. Uh, it was very much like being on a psychedelic, but it was just oxygen. Mm -hmm. I was uh, very cool. Um, and I, I bawled for, for like 20 minutes afterwards. Um, I really got not just the importance of kindness, 
but it's something like the very, very deep choice that is without reason. There's, there's no logic about it. There's, I, I can describe the logic, I can describe the rationale, but the choice itself has nothing to do with that. It is, it is a way which I could recognize, it is fine for me to keep beating myself up. And it is also true that it hurts. And I, in fact, don't want that. And that I can choose to be kind to myself simply because I want it. Hmm. And it, it's um, even in saying this, it sounds a little um, like I, I haven't found a way to really articulate the depth of this choice yet. And I'm not satisfied with the language that I've landed on yet. That's currently the best I can do. And I just want to mention it is actually deeper than that conveys. It's a mm -hmm. it's a feeling thing of, oh, I, there, there's actually a logic piece that feels relevant, um, which is uh, like there's this common thing of the, like the basic structure of a paradox being this sentence is false. Hmm. Is the sentence false or is it true? Hmm. Aha. Hmm. Well, it's, well, it's neither, right? Because it buzzes in some weird sense. You actually have the same paradox. That most people miss this one. And, I, um, and I, uh, I enjoy getting to hold this. It gives my mind something clear to latch onto. But there is a symmetric paradox in the sentence. This sentence is true. Hmm. The thing is that what a mind by default does is go, well, okay, it's true. And that's what it says. Cool. Mm. But you can do the same thing if the sentence is false. Mm. Sentence is false. Well, it says it's true, which is false if it's false, which is consistent. Mm. Right? So there's this, you, you get to choose and whichever one you choose is fine. Um, so there's something that is like that at the level of heart where you can choose, or at least that my experience was that I, I had this choice and I had been making this choice before of something like choosing false, of choosing, um, well, I need to, I have to, there's something wrong with me, I need to fix it, I need to, da, 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 da. but those are the thoughts that are downstream of this deep choice. Hmm. And I just recognized the choice itself and I went, oh, uh, true. <laughs> hmm. So, um, since then, I've been watching this rearrangement happen in my system where um, very much like the Ken show, um, my whole energy system, my mind, my being is realigning with a recognition of it's not that I do metta because it's important to say to deal with the suffering, because that's that's that basic glitch. It's reaching back and trying to do the pain orientation. Um, it, it feels like it, it's changing where my fuel source is instead of fueling myself from uh, pain and then making the, the, like the jolting stuff of terrifying the animal or, or beating the animal with spurs. Instead, it's more choosing the positive side of noticing there are things I care about and I can move towards the things I care about because I care about them mm -hmm. and I can care for them in that way. So in that way, I went for, for about a month after that tipping point when I would, like I went back to a meta practice I had been doing one before, but I hadn't touched it for over a year. Mm. I started doing metta again after that shift, but I didn't bother sending loving kindness to others for a month. Mm. It was just wishing myself well, mm -hmm. just holding that with care. And I can understand where there's a um, where there's a potential glitch in that space of feeding the ego, but the reason for the ego feeding in the first place is because the ego is feeding on the pain loop mm -hmm. and precisely what I was doing was feeding the pleasure loop mm -hmm. and as, as that dissolved it became a lot more clear that I enjoy my experience of myself in being in kind contact with others mm -hmm. and that it's important for my kindness to myself that I cultivate that so it's emerging from the kindness to myself to be kind with others and to cultivate meta with others. Mm -hmm. So that was my experience. It still is ongoing. It's not as intense as it was through February, um, uh, but it's, it's very present still. It still is defining a lot of the background context of how I live and how I am and what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. These insights are quite hard to articulate and, you know, it's, it's often hard to do so in a way that satisfies ourselves, but, um, I don't know, there's something about the way you're describing that that was very helpful for me that I'll have to chew on. But, you know, 
Um, I think it's something about um, the easy to love person. I, I find it helpful sort of pedagog pedagogically to be like, oh, we should start by practicing with the easy to love person, whoever that is for you. You know, maybe it's as someone you actually know or not, or maybe it's yourself, maybe you are easy to love, but whoever that is starting there. And um, it's something about like, yeah, yeah. You said it's like, it's, it's not like a, um, it's like intrinsic. It's like, yeah, you just love because, just because that's what makes sense, not for any logical, rational reason. You can justify it logically, you can justify it rationally, but at the end of the day, you just do love. And that's, that's really the starting point. And um, that was a really helpful, helpful reflection for me. So yeah, thank you for that. And I'm also just feeling the mudita, uh, happy that you're, you know, coming from this place of love. And um, yeah, I know, I know how precious that kind of shift is. So, so thank you for sharing it with us. And um, yeah, as I say, I, there's a lot of other questions I'd love to ask you. So um, just with scheduling, I should probably end for today. But thank you so much for answering. And, and hopefully we can have you back on and, and kind of dive deeper into all the things that you've mentioned. Yeah, I'm happy to keep chatting with you. Thanks for having me. Mm, wonderful.